Hello, Legionnaires, and welcome to some Rando RPG livestream. Tonight, our panel of Dungeon Masters, Game Masters, Referees, Storytellers, and Players will share their diverse tabletop role-playing game experiences to provide ideas, suggestions, and possibly even some advice for your tabletop RPG sessions. Let's get started. Hello and welcome to some Rando RPG live stream. I am John Maxley Oslo, your host, and I'm truly grateful that you are with us for tonight's live stream on how to host tabletop RPGs for children. Oh, this is something that I will never do. <laughs> we'll get into that later, but I think it's a really good topic uh, for folks out there. So what do we do here in some Rando RPG live stream? Well, in segments one through four, we discuss topics surrounding the tabletop role-playing game hobby with an emphasis on individual experiences, desires, and expectations. In tonight's four segments on how to host tabletop RPGs for the youngins, we hope to provide ideas, suggestions, and food for thought for your tabletop RPG sessions. And then in segment five, we let down our hair and just talk about nerd issues of interest. If we meet the giveaway threshold, which I'll discuss in a moment here, segment five is when we will determine the winner. Please consider supporting Legion of Myth through the links in the live stream's description. YouTube takes 30% and Twitch takes 50% of your hard-earned money, while Rumble, PayPal, Streamlabs, and Ko-Fi take between 0 and 5% of your donation. Although I started noticing that PayPal might be taking more. There may have been a change in PayPal. It's taken more than 5% now. What? Rumble rants and super chats of less than $20. I'll read at the end of each segment. $20 or more, I will interrupt the segment. Read your rant or chat as immediately as I can. And $50 or more, I will take a drink in your name. I never prepare for that, by the way. <laughs> I just have to get up and go get my shot glass. I just don't expect it. And uh, you can force the panel to answer any tabletop RPG-related question of your choice right then and there. If we make more than $100... I should say $100 or more in Super Chats or and Rumble Rants. There will be a $25 Palladium Books or drive through RPG gift card giveaway during Segment 5 toward the end of the live stream as a whole. Legion Myth YouTube members as well as tonight's Super Chatters and Rumble Ranters have the opportunity to win, but you must be watching at the time of the giveaway to claim your victory, else it rolls over to next week. And was it last time we streamed? Law Dog won $275. That thing kept rolling and rolling and rolling. It will never get that high again because I will not allow it. There are now uh, bumpers in place. <laughs> Don't forget that Legion Myth moderators will time out or even ban people who attack any panelists or chatter. Attack the argument, not the person, and keep your very social media beefs off my show. I don't have a charity anymore? Okay, fine. We'll just jump to that. <laughs> Please like this video. Then subscribe to all the panelists' channel found in the description. I think... Ooh. Oh no, I was working on another one. I don't have their I don't have their channels in the description yet. I will get them there. And of course, thank you. Thank you, thank you for your time and support. Now, real quickly before we introduce the folks here, I made a promise and I'm going to uh, adhere to my promise. Where is it? I like nine things open here. Boom. There we go. Hopefully you can see that. If not, I'm going to put the link in the description anyway. Or it's actually already in the description. I'm going to put it in the, the chat. Boop. There's a link. If you enjoy Marvel superheroes, face rip, or epic fantasy systems, but want something a little more in the vein of cyber horror, Probably not kid friendly <laughs> for today's theme. Uh, but if you want something more cyber horror, uh, say like Call of Cthulhu meets cyberpunk, then check out Terminus Adventures in the Ever Sprawl. Terminus is a game that explores morally ambiguous nature of anti heroes. This is absolutely the wrong episode to be <laughs> broadcasting this one. Uh, yes, they can be selfish and malicious individuals. Conversely, they might also be individuals who aim to assist the city's inhabitants in eradicating corruption and over throwing its malevolent rulers decision on how to proceed is in your hands and like i said i put the link in the chat and you can find it in the description this is game was written by somebody who's been a longtime follower of legion of myths so i wanted to give him a quick shout out here boom that is it uh well, i'll read the super chat and then we'll introduce our awesome guests for this evening the Gen X GM says, might be back for segment five, but got a game tonight. Have a good stream, folks. You two sure have a great game. Yeah, we're not going to see Bear as much anymore because he wants to game on Friday nights. Like, gaming's important. No, talking about games is important. Not playing them. I might have that backward. All right. Thanks, Bear, for the five bucks. All right. So, with all of that out of the way, joining me tonight, we have uh, 
Okay, I, I'm, I'm going I'm to murder it, and you're going to correct me. That's how we're going to do this. Uh, Francois Desrochers, how close was I? Uh, closer than most of my commanders and, and uh, other bosses have been. Uh, Francois <laughs> de Roche, or just call me Frank. That's oh, fine. it is de Roche. I used to say de Roche, but I saw the S on the end there. It's like, wait a second. I don't think it's supposed to be that. Oh, okay. Frank is fine. Um, I had a commander about 12 years ago start calling me that, and it stuck. So that's, uh, that's, that's basically what everybody calls me now. Everybody, okay, we'll go by Frank then. We can do that. So who are you? What contents or products do you create? And what is your tabletop RPG experience? Uh, my tabletop RPG experience goes uh, back to the 80s. So like most people, my uh, from my uh, vintage, uh, I dealt with a mother who hooked onto the satanic panic when she found <laughs> out that I started playing D&D. Uh, ironically, that disappeared when a buddy of mine, a couple of houses down in the military housing, started playing Robotech and we started playing that game. That introduced me to Palladium Books writ large. Uh, we played Robotech for years uh, yes. until I moved away. And uh, then I started playing Star Wars D6. I, uh, will, um, I will embarrassingly admit to having played Vampire the Masquerade for a year while I was at university. Uh, got out of that. Uh, I've been GMing uh, for Rifts and uh, other games. I did uh, a multi-year D10 system for Legends of the Five Rings. Okay. Played D&D, Pathfinder, Palladium, obviously, most of the games. Uh, and most recently, I uh, was playing uh, some sessions with my 12, 13-year-old daughter who got into the system and role-playing writ large. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that, we'll talk about this, but that, that kind of died away because uh, volleyball team tryouts happened and she and a bunch of her friends took off to go play volleyball. So dad was left on the wayside. Okay. Wait, sports? Or gamer nerd. I, what the, no. Yeah. <laughs> to be fair. Hang out with to, friends or hang out with dad. Like, which yeah, one right? of you think is going to win? Um, <laughs> aside from that, the, the other elements that, that, that has some applicability to this, uh, back in the day, uh, it, it's not TTRPG, but when uh, I was big into 40K, uh, so tabletop war miniature playing, um, I ran a league night uh, once a week that had organized league play and we invited a lot of the youths that started getting into the game. Um, so they only had like maybe 10, 12, 20 models each. Uh, and I started setting up a mentor uh, player versus two, three individuals uh, so that they could understand the game and, and be interested in hanging out and, and doing the same kind of things we do with TTRPGs. Uh, and some of that led into things like dealing with parents and staying to supervise and what eventually turned out into being a free babysitting service for a while. Um, so currently <laughs> now I'm uh, probably mostly concentrated on doing third party content uh, over at my blog, which is uh, scholarlyadventures.com. I don't do YouTube uh, for mostly because of time. The only thing that I have done, the one snippet of YouTube that I have done was a teaser trailer for the blog. Um, and that's it. Which I did watch. I thought it was good. Uh, yeah. Do me a favor. Can you put the link to that? in the? So what I'll do is I'll just add that to the description of this video. Also, I have to interrupt you now. Yeah. Uh, you guys can't see it here because Rumble, for whatever reason, the memberships and Super Chats don't pop over to StreamYard. But I got a $50 Rumble rant, which means I have to drink. And I can't find my wife right now. The light's off in there. So that means I have to go get up, get a shot glass, and get my own drink right now. So uh, I will also read this $2 super chat. And then I will come back and I will drink to the $50 super chatter. In the meantime, so that we're not wasting everybody's time out there. It's supposed to be about the kids. And I'm getting a first. Let's see. I, I shouted yeah. out a, a, a horror <laughs> RPG. And now I'm going to be drinking on stream. This is great. Uh, but it is what it is. Uh, we'll move on to Naga Hyde uh, while I step away. The same question. Then when you're done, if I'm not back for whatever reason, uh, Lord Mateus, same thing. Who are you? What content or products do you create? And what is your tabletop RPG experience? Uh, well, I'm Nagaide Hobbies. I don't create any content currently, uh, but I do have over probably 35 years of gaming experience and running games. I started back in the late 80s with uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles of the Palladium system. And that's that's about it. All right, I guess I'll take over. Um, 
Lord Mattias. I got a, a YouTube channel of the same name. I got a blog called uh, <clears throat> uh, Lord Mattias' um, uh, Ancient Tomes and Wondrous Items. Uh, the blog, I use that for um, first impressions about products I get and, and read. Uh, I, my channel, I use for actual plays and deep dives of the stuff that I've been playing. Um, I got nothing against the flip through review, but um, I find that just simple flip through reviews really don't give you any um, detailed information on whether or not you should be spending your money on the, the product. I mean, the hobby's expensive as it is. So um, I might be moving into more advice type videos soon. Um, I'm also a bit of a amateur game designer and author. I've written for Lamentations of the Flame Princess and The Red Room. I just recently published something for the Wretched Interbellum setting, which is I awesome. Uh, it's called Isle of the Sapphire God. It's first of a trilogy, kind of trying to emulate those 1920s, 1930s pulp novels. Um, it's a hex crawl on a mysterious island, mutant cannibals, stuff, other stuff that's not appropriate for children. <laughs> so, give me the theme tonight. We're going to do this whole thing about, uh, about kids, and then uh, <laughs> we might be. We might nothing's going to be appropriate for them. No, it will be. It will be. But uh, yeah, that's me. And uh, please, you know, check me out. I, I appreciate it. Uh, and could you also throw your link into the private uh, yeah. private chat here? And then I'll just make sure I get all that. And Naga Hyde, anything you've got as well, go ahead and throw in there. All right. So here we go. Now, now I have to start the stream buzzed. So Gunther the Mad, he's both a new member on uh, on Rumble. Which means I have to try to remember to manually add him to the giveaway because I don't automatically download those because Rumble doesn't allow that yet. Uh, he says, uh, I'm feeling particularly chaotic tonight. Let's mess with Max. Well, good job. You're messing with me. This is whiskey. I think it's 80 proof Southern Comfort. And uh, here we go. This is to you, Gunther the Mad. Thank you very much for the $50. And there we go. Oof. Okay. I will not get drunk on stream. I will cut. I will cut off the fifty dollars stuff if people start donating too much. <laughs> I bake that in. <laughs> Do you need some whiskey recommendations? Southern Comfort is. Uh... I, I go cheap or go home. Oof. <laughs> That's serious. Like I, I have a friend of mine. He's a huge Scotch connoisseur. And it's all about the Glen Livets and all that other nonsense. I'm like, okay, you know what? I'm gonna get drunk on like twenty bucks. You're gonna get drunk on like two hundred bucks. I win. <laughs> so. You don't get drunk on the 200 stuff. That's that's wrong. Oh, well, I'm a bourbon guy, and it doesn't matter what the price of the bottle is. Bourbon is meant to be drunk. So I'll get drunk on $10 <laughs> to 200 <laughs> All right. Let me. Uh, so everybody's link should be in the description now, and I appreciate that. Okay. Let's actually try to make this a little bit family friendly now. <laughs> no and more drinking. Go. <laughs> and all right. One day we'll start, right? All right, so we're going to start off. So segment number one is going to be just understanding the audience, what, understanding what it means to run games for kids. And we're going to start with uh, Frank. I'm not used to calling you Frank. That's going to be a tough one, but I, I'll do it. I'm going to do it, uh, Frank, over here. So what age group of children have you hosted RPG games for, and how did you tailor the experience to suit their age? So the, the only... RPG experience, uh, like pull out a book and start rolling dice and creating characters, was with my my second daughter. My first daughter wanted nothing to do with me on that, uh, but my second one showed an interest, and uh, we started uh, playing a what would essentially be a, a Rifts Heroes Unlimited kind of blend. Um, <laughs> so she, uh, it was just her and I having a bonding experience at the dining room table. Uh, once I got my wife over the whole satanic panic that she jumped into as well, um, she had questions and were you know she was she had some reservations about th the baby daughter playing this game, regardless of the fact that it was me supervising it at the dinner table where she could see and hear everything. Um, so uh, she was uh, we started when she was eleven. She's now thirteen. So um, so in that bracket and of course obviously back in the day we were always you know back in high school you, you remember back in the time when you were playing various rpgs at that at that scale and scope um 
whether or not you were playing it correctly or not um, was was in, an interesting sidebar. Uh, the other example was that 40K uh, league night where we had kids as young as 10 and some as old as maybe 18 just getting into the hobby. Uh, so that, that, that gives you a, a bit of a length and breadth of the dynamic in terms of what I was dealing with. Okay. Uh, did you do anything specific to tailor the game for their ages? Uh, I mean, one on one with your daughter, yeah. that one that one seems easier. So, actually, yeah. let me let me backtrack for a second. Have you done it for a group? Have you run it for a group of children? The the attempt was made, but again, uh, I'm dealing with twelve uh, year old girls, and that isn't exactly the prime target audience for sure. okay. uh, role playing games in terms of that aspect. Okay, that makes sense. Um, from a group, it was largely it, it would largely be the the forty k experience, which translates, but it's not necessarily one to one. Yeah, one's more of a miniatures war game. Uh, so, okay, so did how did you tailor the experience? You already said that you kind of did a one on one, but uh, how did you tailor the experience for your daughter? Then, like, I, I, did you have her spend four hours making a character? And, no. And, this, this was uh, definitely something where uh, she developed, uh, like I was explaining rifts in general to her because she was interested in the pile of books that I was looking through. So I asked her to just, uh, as an improv session, we decided to go ahead and, and show her uh, dice mechanics for actions, for skill tests and stuff like that. She got into it. She got jazzed up. And then we uh, ended up just actually developing a scenario on the fly. I gave her dice. She started rolling. She started presenting uh, a, a lot more savvy in terms of role playing experience than I've seen out of adults closer to my age. Um, so that was uh, like at one point she went over a fence and uh, she rolled a climb and she failed. So I told her, OK, you fell over the edge and you ripped your pants. And she spent the next five minutes talking to me about like, now I'm pissed off. Now I got to deal with my pants. How am I going to fix my pants? I was like, okay, not not anything to do with the actual scenario. She just went all in about clothing. Um, so figure an 11, 12-year-old girl would start taking that as a tangent. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, the, the actual adventures and the stuff that we were doing was leveraged mostly by taking her TV shows that she was interested in. Uh, and there was two in particular that were targeted to girls uh, that were kind of like G.I. Joe for girls. Okay. Um, it's, uh, like a miraculous ladybug, which was like a show about, um, some people out in Paris solving crimes. Uh, it's always the same kind of sinister dude that you're going against. Uh, so I leveraged that by creating a secret spy organization that she became part of, uh, her character I created on her behalf. Uh, and then she became part of that secret spy organization, chasing after and fighting another secret spy organization. And it was basically just a bunch of one-shot adventures uh, to maintain her attention span for that time period. Uh, and then there was another show that I kind of drew. Basically, you just go onto the Wikipedia, you look at the uh, list of the different episodes, and you start taking plot adventure ideas, and you just throw it into a one-shot. There is a start, there is a there is an end. There's you just throw maybe two or three different uh friction points or adventure nodes that she has to overcome or avoid as the case may be uh and then off we go we're, we're rolling dice and she's doing the do the only other thing that i did for this was i did create based off of our family dog a npc based off of a coalition dog boy okay well, it was the family dog that was out there helping her in her adventures. So if she got into a scrap, the dog boy was there to help her out. Uh, it was also a great mechanism in, in, in that if she wasn't getting what I was trying to lay down, again, 12 years old, uh, she's not going to catch everything that I'm trying to put in front of her. Mm -hmm. I used the NPC as a mechanism to find the clue that she just doesn't know to look for or rolls the perception check that she didn't think to do or that she failed uh, so that we could move the adventure along. Uh, it was just one of those, almost like a cheat code. A little uh, Scooby-Doo so effect, right? Pr pretty much, yeah, that's exactly what it was. It was just a, a, a cheat code that I leveraged to allow me to roll dice with my daughter, so it's not just her all the time. 
Uh, and then, um, you know, I'm, I'm rolling dice for the mooks and the red shirts, uh, you know, co the, the enemy forces ended up looking a lot like uh, what Cobra would have looked like from G.I. Joe. Uh, so it was just a lot of leveraging common TV references that she was able to hoist aboard and more easily understand. Okay. Let's uh let's bounce on down to Naga Hyde here. I'll ask him the same uh, primary question here. What age group of children have you hosted RPG games for, and how did you tailor the experience to suit their age? Uh, so I started with my own children as well. Uh, my son was about eleven or twelve, uh, and my daughter was about seven or eight at the time. Now my son is going to be 22 here in a couple of weeks so that tells you how long i've been gaming with my children well, at least my son so um in terms of how i tailored the experience usually when i'm running a game i have a lot of what you would say adult content so i just cut almost all of it out uh, <laughs> Uh, so I don't go into details about the type of violence, you know, if they're hitting somebody with a sword, I just say they hit, I don't go into the depths of what the sword does to the other person. Uh, I also curb the violence or not the violence, but the language of the NPCs and the people that they interact with to make it more kid friendly. And I, and if there's any like tricks or puzzles that i add into the game i try and make them more simple something that they might recognize from uh a, a board game or mm -hmm. a recent tv show that we may have watched together so uh how do you introduce the the basic concepts of an rpg uh, to a kid who's new to the hobby, like like how how do you just how do you break it to them? Like, hey, let's try this, and this is what it's about. Well, I was lucky f with my kids; they wanted to play. They they always saw me looking through my riffs books, uh, and they were like, "Can we play?" You know, they wanted to play. They 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 just asked to play. So I said, "Okay." Let's sit down and let's make a character. So you start and, on easy uh, mode is what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Four hour session, uh, making characters. Yeah. Easy mode. So, I mean, I, we, we went through, like I went through step by step. How do you, how do you roll the dice for each stat? How do you choose your skills? Everything. Interesting. You, you did that all right away. Uh, you showed them the yeah, math, yeah. basically the schoolwork that they had to do, because we're talking riffs here. Yeah. yeah. Like, did yeah. you did you do your homework? Yes, Dad. No, no, you didn't. <laughs> I got some homework for you to well, do now. So, so to be fair, by the time my son was playing riffs at eleven or twelve, he was already in algebra. So, it was it was easy to teach him the math, and, and my daughter understood the math pretty pretty good she's she's great with numbers so okay uh lord mateus bouncing over to you now same question what age group of children have you hosted rpg games for and how did you tailor the experience to suit their age um all right well uh by the first time i ran like a one shot for parents and their kids was before the pandemic with a, a group that i had been running and um, they were around between the ages of six and 10, I believe. Okay. Um, and then during the pandemic, the lockdowns, you know, my son wasn't in uh, preschool and I needed to do something. So I, he was four and I started, I made a real simple like character sheet, uh, I, an idea I got from uh, Professor Dungeon Master, where his hit points were just different versions of a smiley face until he had X's in the eyes. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah. And, and, um, uh and now he's eight and we play shadow dark so just me and him but i also have a, a keep on the borderlands game why with... does shadow dark not sound like a game you would play with kids 
Well, I actually chose it because, well, I'll get into, I'll, I'll jump into this. Um, so, so I, I have this concept of like your own personal appendix and, you know, the, the kinds of media that influence your game. My son is really into Minecraft. Okay. okay. And I did play hero quest with him. And one day I asked him, what do you like better? Shadow dark or hero quest? And he goes, hero quest sucks. And I'm like, <laughs> why? And he, and he says, because you're stuck on a board and you're going down these hallways and there's not much you can do with shadow dark i can do whatever i want and in our solo games he made a dwarf fishmonger he just wanted to go out fishing and sell his fish in the market and of course going out into the wilds i'm doing zero prep style so i'm just rolling to see what happens he ends up getting into these adventures he got jumped by some thugs almost got killed there was some tears um but then the very next day, he come back and goes, I want to play again. Uh, and his whole his sole purpose was to get revenge on those thugs, <laughs> which he did, which he did. And he ended up getting like this huge treasure pile. And he was very proud of himself. So. The moral of this story for children is seek revenge. <laughs> so, um, uh, so yeah, I, I mean... I felt like Shadow Dark would be perfect. I mean, I wanted to teach him like the sort of like the OSR experience. I wanted to like, I do think consequences are important I'm, and we'll be talking about this later. Um, and I just, it, I also thought Shadow Dark was kind of, it's kind of an easy game to pick up. Okay. Um, and it's really easy to play zero prep. Um, I've, and um, so anyway, yeah. So I've been playing four to 12 year olds and the keep on the borderlands game is also Shadow Dark. And um you know, we, we had a blast. I mean, they almost got killed by kobolds because they weren't paying attention and weren't playing as a team, but then they did play as a team and defeated the um, bandits that are South of the South of the keep. So um, yeah, it's been, it's been fun. Um, and uh, uh, I was able to, you know, during the pandemic, get introduce my son to math a little early. Um, uh, Naga, I was talking about like using, puzzles that they would be able to uh kind of solve i he had to trace magic runes which was his name so that's how he started learning how to write you know things like okay. that so um yeah that's that's pretty much uh what my experience has been and um so, now that so school's what, back we're probably going to pick up the uh, keep on the borderlands game hopefully soon so it sounds like you're doing a lot of old school stuff there. Uh, are there any specific themes or genres that you find, even with something like Keep on the Borderlands? Obviously, we know that's fantasy, but things that you can add or elements that you can tweak in there that uh, you find that help engage children better? Well, um, again, kind of going to like the Minecraft issue, like my son loves Minecraft and I think it's because, you know, he's, he's a kid, he's creative, he likes building things. So I make sure like he has that opportunity. Um, the 12 year old kids that these are the children of some adults that I know that I game with. So it's kind of like a Dungeons and Dads day. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, I don't know them well enough yet. Um, right now they're just doing a lot of goofy stuff, uh, but I'm allowing it, you know, just so they can have some fun. Um, but when my son was like, yeah, I want to go fishing. Well, Shadow Dark doesn't have fishing rules. So like, well, we worked it out and I got to create some stuff, which made it fun for me coming up some homebrew. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much what I do. I just listen to what there, there was a saying, uh, or you have to go to where your kids are um, as mm -hmm. they're getting old. Right. So like you may want them to be into the stuff that you're into and they might not be into. So like uh, the fact that he wanted to try a tabletop or RPG uh, was great. I wanted to share my absolute favorite hobby with my son. And so when he says he wants to build uh, a fishing pole and go fishing by gum, we're going to do it. <laughs> so, you know, it's funny because all three of you in, in some form or fashion have all tapped into things that we're going to discuss later, which is cool. Uh, I don't really have any other follow-ups here because uh, you guys did a good job of addressing them. Uh, and I know that we're going to be asking more poignant questions uh, in a bit. So I think uh, unless there's anything you guys wanted to follow up with each other about, uh, I'll read some chats and then we'll move on to the next question. Okay. So got a few things start here. Uh, uh, let's do the rumble side first. Uh, already read the fifty dollars super chat let, or rumble rant. Let's uh, thank Gunther the Matt again for fifty dollars and uh, and apparently people did not like the fact that I drank Southern Comfort. <laughs> oh well, that's what I had in the house. 
it's either that or brandy. I think that's the only other thing we've got. And I took a shot of brandy one time and ooh. Uh, anyway, uh, Dara Mouth over on Rumble says, uh, hello, fellow Rumbler. Hope you're having a great day and even better weekend. Have fun. Well, the weekend's just starting and we're having fun right now. So we're off to a good start. So I appreciate that. Thank you very much for the $2 over there on Yield Rumble. Um, I think I posted this before, but just in case I didn't, Law Dog for $2 says, hey, that guy wrote Riffs Free Quebec. Yep. Weird Canadians. <laughs> hey, if you want it done right, go to the source. <laughs> are you, you know, wait, are you another Quebecois? Uh, my, I am, I am actually a Francophone. Uh, you wouldn't know it from my, my accent, uh, but my native language is French. My language of instruction for school was English though. Um, but yeah, I, my family was originally from, from, uh, the Montreal region. So I, so I have to have you, Mr. Max Boyvent and Bear on all at the same time. And then I'll never know what the heck is going to be said. Cause you're all from Yale, Quebec. <laughs> We'll, we'll throw in the spy talk and you will not have any clue what we're talking about. And it's funny because, uh, I, well, I'm not fluent, but I can speak French, like uh, French, French. But when these, when these weird Canadians start speaking that fake French, I'm like, I have no clue what the hell they're saying. I caught a word. I caught it. Anyway, uh, let's see. Uh, no, no. Why is that starred? Start that one. Anyway. Zach Appleton says, for those looking for an RPG for younger kids, check out Amazing Tales. Very entry level and simplistic or simple rules. Good heroic opportunity. I have not heard of that one. Uh, I'll get to the one that uh, we talk about on this channel uh, in a minute here. Shark says, playing with kids is always so much fun. I love running games for a bunch of kids. Kids always make the game super fun for everyone. Always boggles me how kids never worry about stupid stuff. And then they become teenagers. And then stupid stuff finds them. <laughs> yeah, stupid stuff finds them. There you go. Uh, Frank, love the pictures on the wall behind you. We said pictures, so we'll go with all of them. Yeah, the, well, they're all Rift's pictures. Yeah. <laughs> I have a few of those at work because I ran out of room here. So they're up on, uh, on uh, my shelf at work. Uh, so thank you for the $2, there, sir. So the game that we talk about, and it's actually, I think it's to this day, still our highest, uh, our most watched video. It's a pretty old one, but uh, it was Hero Kids. Heathen Dog did an overview of Hero Kids back on the old Legion Myth Weekly live stream. And I think, uh, yeah, like I said, for us, we got like 20,000 some views on that one, if I remember correctly. People still watch it. So uh, I like, and I don't know many kid games. I would never run games for kids. Uh, I, again, don't take that as any sort of like you know weird way. It's just uh, it's not my interest uh, to do so. But uh, yeah, I really like the way Hero Kids progressed. You could do a really simplistic method. You could do a little bit more moderate method, and then you could do a, a full on hey, figure out the simple math method. And I and I like that progression uh, as is from four to ten. But uh, I think somebody else said another game, but uh, I don't see it on here. And I don't want to go digging too far for it. So, sorry, not going to go digging for it. But uh, yeah, if, if you've got games that you think would be great for kids, uh, especially later on when this video goes uh, public in a month, uh, go ahead and post them into the comments so that other people see what other games are great for kids out there. And with that, we're going to move on to our second question for this first segment. And that is, we'll start with Nagahide on this one. How do you assess the interests and attention spans of children when playing a game session. Uh, so f if I'm not running like a D and D adventure book or anything where there's a very specific story and I'm going to play kind of more off the cuff or off the mind, uh, I try and f focus it on their interests by asking them like, what are some of their favorite movies? anime books or tv shows things that they're interested in so i can do research figure out what those entail because i don't watch a lot of children's tv <laughs> what? so yeah i don't know um and then i'll take aspects of that stuff and blend it into whatever game i'm playing whether it's dungeons and dragons or uh, a palladium system like ninja turtles or Riffs. 
uh, in regards to um, the attention spans mm -hmm. that it really depends on the age um and their complete interest in in playing the game uh so if they get fidgety at at the table or they want to get up and leave to go and get something or or they're talking to somebody else at the table then you know that you have to try and pull them back into the game so usually what i do then is i'll ask them what what are you what's your character doing right now in this scenario you know whether like if if they're in a traveling down a road what is what's your character doing are they just standing or walking along the wagon are they sitting in the wagon are they playing an instrument you know stuff like that to try and re-engage them back into the game um so yeah okay um, uh, by the way your audio is getting a little choppy for some reason not sure sounds like you might have a short i don't know it's cutting in and out but uh we, we did get everything that you said there though uh, okay. what um what methods do you use to ensure that now, now again you you only do this with your kids right you don't do this more publicly like uh like with their friends or anything like that i have ran a couple uh uh games with my son's friends when they were a little bit okay. older like 15 16 and the, so that was a dungeons and dragons campaign i brought their f favorite anime at the time was sword art online uh so i took a uh what's it what was it a guild from that anime and brought it into dungeons and dragons it was the laughing coffin guild from sword art online uh there they were murderers and villains in in the anime so i brought them in and had the players trying to figure out who were the members of this guild and figuring out how to stop them so okay we'll move on over to lord Matthias. i don't know i keep on to call you Matthias. i've just been doing it for so long uh how do you assess the interest and attention spans of children when planning a game session well i'm i'm a little different from what naga Hyde said i okay. assume i'm going to lose their interest because their kids <laughs> especially like my my son who's very energetic so like when we when it's just he and I we play about ninety minutes at a time, uh, maybe two hours. Uh, when with the Shadow Dark on the Borderlands campaign, uh, it was like I planned for three hours, um, but I paid very close attention. And if I saw that they were getting fidgety, because they're not my kids, right? I'm not going to sit there start like berating them or anything like that. <laughs> you sit uh, down right now. <laughs> I know, right? This is D and D. Um, uh, I, uh, I, I would just start kind of figuring out, okay, it's time to wrap it up. You know, I'm not going to try to, I want them to enjoy the experience and I don't want them to make it feel like it's a chore. Um, certainly throughout the session, you know, I am definitely, what are you doing? Like, how are you doing it? Go ahead and describe. Um, but, uh, I, I just, I figure, um, but I think it would be easiest, I guess the path of least resistance. If if they're starting to feel like looking like they're kind of getting done with the session, I'll I'll work to wrap it up. Um so they can walk away with a positive experience and not feel like they were bored or they were forced to do something they didn't want to do, kind of thing. Um I did want to mention that the 12 year olds, the 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 children of my gaming group who I've, I've ran, uh, I forgot to mention that they're actually in a 5e um, club at school. Okay. Which was another reason why I wanted to run Shadow Dark and keep on the Borderlands because I'm like, this isn't 5e. And it's, uh, you know, they, this one girl actually kept asking me. It was actually kind of funny. Every time she asked me something, it was like this mother may I, but she would always add the adjective legally. Can I do this legally? Can I do this legally? And I'm like, yes, this isn't 5e. There's, you know, just tell me what you want to do if you need to roll i will let you know you know mm -hmm. just describe what your character's doing and at the end of the the for her first session it's like this was a lot of fun 
I, I want to play again. And I'm like, yes. <laughs> that, you said something there, and I'm going to tangent for just a moment. Sorry, but uh, it, it's a pet peeve of mine. It is, I'm glad you did that because one of the things that I, and I've been mentioning this on various streams, is that, oh, my character can't do that. What do you mean? I only have a plus two. That means you're better than normal. Or can my character do these things? What would make you think that you could or could not? Right. Now, I wouldn't do this to a child at all, but you know, what would make you think you could or couldn't? Well, I don't see it in my character. Okay. Can you as a human being right now attempt to do what it is that you want to do? Yes. Yeah. Then yes, you can do it. It's my job as the game master to figure out what skill it is, what proficiency it is, what role it is, whatever else. I it really irks me when especially adults or people who've been playing a long time is like, oh yeah, you can't do this in this game. What do you mean you can't do it? So, so we get we get our balls busted a little bit because we went off on Dragon Bane because Dragon Bane says you can't dash in darkness. Now I get why the rule says that, okay? I understand how the game is set up. <laughs> but ultimately it's like, if you want to run with scissors in the dark, go for it. It's my <laughs> right. job as the game master to, to say what happens because of that or have you make a role because of that. So yeah, I kind of don't like that legalese rule that Dragon Bane has there, which I think encourages exactly what you ran into. So I'm I'm really glad that you're breaking people of that habit. Use this, not well, pretend this is a character sheet, not this. Go with what what is it what do you think you could do as a person of this caliber at this time? That's what you should be thinking, not what do the numbers say right then and there. Yeah, and and that's uh that's part of I think, and we'll probably be getting into this later. But I mean, I, I to me that's fundamental to the, um, I guess the things you can learn from playing role playing games is is like the problem solving. So you re mm -hmm. and and it's also part of the immersion. I mean, they they go hand in hand. So, um, it was actually kind of funny because my son the eight-year-old uh had been playing shadow dark with me he would never ask those questions he's like i'm just gonna go do this you know i'm gonna <laughs> go fishing and then he ended uh, he, he's the reason why they found the bandit camp because he saw smoke rising from the trees and uh, that girl actually said to him she's like you're really good at this and he goes he just kind of shrugged he's like i play shadow dark all the time <laughs> and so um uh it, it, it but it was really interesting to see the kind of that juxtaposition between my son who jumped into sandbox play immediately and then these uh these 5e um <laughs> after school kids who are probably used to following a strict mm -hmm. module or something and um the the more uh i guess tabletop uh, grid play because that's another thing in my shadow dark on the borderlands game there's no battle mats it's all theater of the mind um awesome yeah, I'm like I said, I'm trying to I'm I, I told the the my buddies who I game with regularly, I'm like, look, I'd like to do this Dungeons and Dads things because there's something really special about the game. And I sort of feel like the, the specialness is slipping away. So I, this is me trying to teach the old ways. Like I'm I'm that old guy, you know, trying to teach the the youngins, you know, uh this the the secret language or whatever. <laughs> So, um, but they were all for it and it, it's the, the, the couple sessions we've played so far have been a lot of fun. And, um, like I said, I hope we get to now that school's back in session and we have normal schedules, we'll be able to get it back going again. So cool. All right. Well, let me bounce off uh, to Frank here and we're going to start with the same question. How do you assess the interests and attention spans of children when planning a game session? Yeah. To, to follow a lot of the comments that have already been made, I mean, like, Research for, for younger, like I'm talking 8 to 14 shows, your attention spans are probably going to be fairly limited to about 40 minutes, maybe 60. Older than that, upwards to, you know, late teens into your 20s, you could you could probably have them hanging off of, uh, you know, the edge of your dice, so to speak, uh, for those eight-hour sessions, depending on how long and how, how well immersed they are into the campaign. Uh, mm -hmm. But for the younger ones, body language, those nonverbal cues that we mentioned, fidgeting in space, um, or they're always reaching for the cell phone, um, if you let them have it, I don't. But when she starts looking over my shoulder to say where where I, I very visibly placed it, okay, uh, we're, we're going to wrap this up. But it's a lot of it's like stage management uh, of engagement, both of the person playing but also through the vehicle of their character. So you, you, you grab their attention by getting, okay, what is your character doing at this point? Or this is happening to your character. What do you want to do? 
Do you want to just stand there and die, or do you want to actually uh, die for cover and and maybe uh, shoot back, or or whatever the case may be? That's that's an extreme example. I only had to use that once, and she got over that. Um, or more to the point, I would use the NPC. Hey, the NPC is diving behind a dumpster. Maybe, maybe you should too. Uh, and, and think about what to, to, to do in reaction to what's going on. Um, but don't expect, like, necessarily, to, to one of the comments that was in the chat, um, don't expect an eight-hour session out of a 12-year-old. A um, what? Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, back in the day, I, I certainly remember doing those. Um, but then we were also trying to figure out Thaco half the time. So a lot of that was math. <laughs> um, but then it, it's, it's don't discount the possibility of having a longer session. Uh, there were some that, that went longer than I thought. And, and like was already said, two to three hours is typically probably the most you're going to get. Um, you target the actions and the NPC reactions to the player and the player character strengths to draw them in get them to own a decision-making dynamic, whatever that is, whether it's an action, a puzzle, an actual interaction with NPCs, whatever that happens to be. Um, and, and you make sure that you don't take necessarily the shyest person in the group and say, hey, you're now the face of the group. You're going to talk to the mayor and convince them. No, maybe that's I probably... I don't want to. Yeah, exactly. And, and you're going to be... You're going to be pulling teeth to try and get that to happen. Um, and just like most groups, if you get a group of kids together, whether they're a bunch of 12-year-olds, 15-year-olds, 18-year-olds, uh, one or two of them is going to come out and, and be that, that, that leader position, whatever the case may be, whether it's through action, whether it's through combat, whether they're the ones that are always solving the puzzles. Um, yet you have to try and tailor what it is that you're presenting to allow everybody to have the opportunity to be engaged and to contribute, even if it's just talking to each other to, to try and game a solution off table or out of character uh, and, and, and give them those opportunities to, uh, to, to have an inject, to have input into the scenario as you're moving things forward. So in, in a specific sense, uh, you know, if you want to cite examples, that'd be great. Uh, what methods do you use to ensure that each child feels included and has a chance to shine? Uh, for this one, I'd, I'd probably have to leverage more the 40K sessions that we were doing, uh, where we had two or three kids that were at the table playing against those mentors. Um, and the same kind of idea uh, translates into tabletop role-playing games, where you've got your mentor that is playing with two or three people on the other side of the table. Uh, so it's effectively a game master. Um, don't, don't pick on the one kid. So in the, the 40K sense, you're, you're playing your army against their three, whatever it is that they've put on the table. Um, to win the game, obviously, you could just concentrate everything on the one kid and then blow them off the table. Well, that's not the experience that you're there for. Um, you're trying to interact and engage with the people on the other side of the table, for lack of a better term. And you want to make sure that they have something to do and something to say. Uh, and, and that is entirely dependent on the scenario and the personalities of the individuals that you're sitting at a table with. Uh, and that's part of the stage management. And um, one of those soft skills that as a game master, sometimes, like, like this is not something that I would recommend for a beginning game master. Uh, stage management of individuals, even as an adult, can sometimes be problematic. Um, <laughs> with kids, you're, you're, you're dealing with a different dynamic because you have parents of those kids that have just as much a voice in terms of uh, how and what it is that you're doing. It's always after the fact. But if you're if you're discounting the parental influence or the parental voice in what you are putting down on the table for the kids to interact with, uh, then then you're setting yourself up for failure, not in terms of the gameplay, but in terms of your interaction with the parent, because um, if you don't take that into account, you're, you're going to get yourself into trouble. Um, it's funny you say that because I had a follow up question that I actually crossed off 
that was directly related to a parent's influence over the children. So I'm actually glad you brought that up and kind of showed me that I was wrong. I shouldn't have crossed that one off. No, but it's, uh, it's, but that's, it's, a, that's a very key point. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a very key point. Uh, when I was doing the 40K League, I had parents that would come in and would stand there and essentially sit behind their kid's shoulder just to make sure that, you know, little Johnny and Susie wasn't getting picked on, for lack of a better term. Um, you know, my wife was listening in to our first sessions to make sure that I wasn't doing something to reinforce this whole satanic panic idea, uh, the foolishness that is that, that concept. So once we get an idea, we start rolling through the actual gameplay and you get them to buy into what it is that you're selling. Because essentially that's what you're doing. You're selling an experience for those kids to have a uh, an engagement with a a game that doesn't involve an LCD screen, um, <laughs> and 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 this is a uh, an increasing rarity nowadays uh, th that I think is probably a, a, a very important aspect to to discuss. Uh, you're not on the screen, but your parents are bought into it, and they're basically letting somebody else look after their kids for maybe two three hours, whatever that is. I, I think it's something that definitely has to be considered and not every game master uh, is up to the challenge. Isn't the proper term that I want to use, um, but maybe doesn't necessarily have the, uh, the, the mentality to take into account those disparate uh, injects into, into the game. It's outside looking in, but it's still something that has an effect. Well, it's, it's like a coach for a sports team. Exactly. So you're, you're there, you've got the parents in the background on the bleachers, yelling at the coaches, yelling at the umpires. You can go look at YouTube a plenty about how that can go wrong. Um, and, and it's the same idea. You, you can, you can find yourself wrecked because little Johnny or Susie said or did something that mom and dad maybe misinterpreted, but as long as you have their buy-in at the very beginning, and, and it doesn't have to be total buy-in, they just have to be comfortable enough to approach you to discuss whatever the topic du jour happens to be, throw a little French in there, um, and and <laughs> and to as long as they're comfortable to approach you and have that discussion, and you are comfortable discussing with them what the problem space was, what the solution was that you presented, and how you moved forward, um, that that is something to keep in mind and to always keep in mind, just in case that pops up. All right. Um, I know I should move on to the next segment, but I've got two more follow-ups here that I think are actually valuable that we can dive into. But I'm going to open this up to all of you guys. Uh, don't talk over each other, but at the same time, I don't care who speaks up first. It doesn't matter. So the we've talked about, you know, learning the children's interests and so forth. So what methods do you use to gather information about children's interests before the game? Now, I'm going to caveat this. Can't talk about your own kids in this one because that's too easy. You already know that one. Like we're talking about the external uh, 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 children. So what methods you use to gather information about the children's interests before the game? I have them uh -oh. write it down. Write down, have, your, write write down. down their interests on a piece. Their interests. Like okay. are, what, are they interested in sports? Are they interested in science fiction, fantasy? What books are do they enjoy? What movies do they enjoy? Though I have them write all of that down on a on a piece of paper before we even start talking about character creation, okay. because based on their interests, I can use that information to help guide them towards a character that they might be more interested in playing instead of sitting there looking through the book going. Well, I don't know what this one can do, and I don't know what this one can do. If I have their interests written down, I can help them figure that out. Does it also help you tailor your adventure at all? Oh, yeah, totally. Because I'll throw in Easter eggs all over the place, especially once I know what everybody's interests are. And I do my own research on what those things might be if I'm not already aware. Then I can throw in Easter eggs all over the place for them. So. Okay. I was just going to say that I, you know, I talked to the parents, um, <clears throat> not that I have like this really super formal process, uh, like a sign in sheet or something, but like, uh, um, you know, with the keep on the borderlands, my buddy Cody, I was just like, yeah, so your, your kid could, and his friends play D and D. He's like, yeah, they're in a five E 
club at school. So I'm like, that's all I needed to know that keep on the borderlands would be perfect. Cause they'd be fighting goblins and orcs and this, that, and the other thing. Um, there, there was the game before the pandemic. That was really more of a horror story. And we can get into that probably in the next seg- segment. But um, again, I kind of knew what uh, the kids were into because I had gamed with the, those parents um and i knew the like the this one guy's a ad- uh, daughter who was at the time 15 or 16 she was into critical role you know so during the game like when she was hamming things up and she had her little accent going you know i i fed into that you know i let her let her do that you know um but uh but yeah i um i basically just kind of like talk to the parents and, and it's easy because the parents i'm talking to are people i already game with um, I haven't done the go to the friendly gaming store and be like, hey, I want to play games with your kids. <laughs> I feel like that'd be kind of okay, creepy. Yeah, yeah, let's not, let's, we've already had drinking and uh, something <laughs> yeah. else on a, a horror game. Yeah. On the, we don't need to dive down that rabbit hole. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> um, but I do, I do want to bring this up and this might also kind of tie into the next segment too. There, uh, a close friend of mine that I game with, he's got a close friend who's into gaming and has a son around my son's age. And I invited him. I don't know this guy very well. I've met him like once and I invited him to come and play shadow dark with us and his son and um and i i told him i'd be more than happy to have a conversation with you because you know you don't know me um but uh he he said no he said no because um you know i don't want to get into politics here but you know he read a little bit about shadow dark and and uh the 5e tie-in and he he's like no that he's a very very conservative guy he's like no and i'm like okay okay the the table's open. You're always welcome, though. You know that's my general philosophy. You know, so you know that's one of those weird situations where I, look. I'll be completely honest with folks. Uh, I don't have kids. I can't have kids, but uh, I have reasons why I don't like certain companies and certain games. And that yes, there's absolutely some I would not play, even with my best friends. And nope, not gonna do it. But I wouldn't do that. At least I don't think I would do that when it comes to my kid. I'm not saying that that's a bad father at all in any way, shape, or form. I would say, you know what? If this is what's going to get your foot in the door, go do it. Join that 5e group that's at your school. And then come home and let's look at some books. You know, something like Because you, you know how kids are. Every one of us. I was a kid. You guys have kids. Doesn't matter. If dad does it, it sucks. If my friends do it, it's cool. Right. So do that thing with your friends and then we'll improve upon it. You know, th- that that's my mentality. But uh, I, I got gotcha. you. Uh, Frank, is there anything you want to add to that as well? Uh, yeah, it's um, session zero, uh, for lack of a better term. Um, right. I'm actually looking to uh, link up with one of our local friendly local gaming stores to do something of a, a West Marches kind of concept. Uh, for for rifts or to see what kind of interest there might be um, and and if the market includes a group dynamic that is younger I, I don't have a problem with that uh, my first session zero would probably include something that has uh, discussion time with mom and dad however that works out uh, and then very much like was discussed what are your interests what is it that you're looking to do and 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 have you ever played before? Because uh, you know, Rifts and Palladium is not necessarily the first go-to game that most people would think of for no. younger audiences. Um, and we'll get into some of the ways and the nuances that you can play around with that. Um, but session zero, I would probably come with uh, some pre-generated characters, or at the very least, like streamline to the extreme the character generation process. Uh, and, and, and basically just spoon feed them for an introductory session so they get an idea of what it is that they're getting into. And if for some reason you see your buddy that's playing, uh, you know, a, a combat cyborg and you've got the Leyline Walker and this just isn't your, uh, you know, the brand that you want to buy, so to speak, this isn't your jam. Uh, hey, let, let's switch it up. Let's find you something different, a headhunter, another cyborg whatever the case may be, as long as you're comfortable and happy playing uh, and rolling dice, we're good to go. I really, really don't have time for this follow-up, but I've got to ask it. And, and the, just so, you, so the people out there know, the reason why I'm asking this is because I think these questions 
part of what we're supposed to do here is to say, hey, this is what we do. This is how we do it. This is what the result was, not just throw out abstract ideas, but no, 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 this is what I've done. And this is why it worked or oops, this is why it didn't work. So that when you're watching, you can actually pull a good idea or say, oh, that's not going to work for me. So again, I'm opening this up to all three of you. So again, whoever wants to jump in. So specifically, what strategies do you use? Now, if you've got a six hour session, the kid is just not watching. We all know that children are children. It might be time to wrap it up. Got that. But you know, you're only 20 minutes, 30 minutes into the session. So what strategies do you use to keep the children focused and entertained throughout the session? Um, I, well, I sort of, I'm, this might be a, a, a refrain, this entire conversation, but shadow darks always on initiative where you're just kind of going around the table. I, I haven't had a problem. Like I said, after a couple hours, three hours, I start seeing like the, the 12 year old boy and the 12 year old girl giving each other eyes and they're passing notes. I'm like, okay, it's time. But like during the game, like it's very familiar, that mechanic, that initiative mechanic, because it's like a board game. Um, and so they always know that they're, they're going to get an opportunity to do something. So, um, so that, I guess that's almost like a cheat. I would recommend doing something like that because it seems to work. Uh, just don't worry about initiative all the time. Just roll it. Okay. Go around the table. Um, and uh and i and again i we've kind of touched upon this too uh go to where they are you know if you if if you're like rip raring to play like the dragon lance chronicles and your kid shows up and says i'm going to play a dwarven fishmonger well raceland can wait you know what i mean <laughs> no <laughs> <laughs> you know uh Takesis can wait in fact Takesis might might actually enjoy some fish you know uh that kind of thing and i and i think that's you just need to be that kind of flexible and don't um impose like cuz you're this is not about you i mean it is a little bit um but this is about getting them involved in the hobby and enjoying it and wanting to continue so at some point kind of like when you're teaching your kid how to ride a bike at one point you just take your hands off the and then they're off doing their own thing like so I, i'm a setting purist but i think you hit the nail on the head when it comes you just can't be that way when it comes to children you got to give them their freedom to to imagine and just understand that you know what when the kid gets older if he enjoys this game then you can start focusing folks say okay so this is now the right yeah i'm going to say the words the right way to do this you know and still have fun with it but yeah i i'm in 100 percent agreement with you on that let let them let them try their their stuff and have fun and if it doesn't make sense too bad it doesn't make sense you know that's the kid's imagination let's move forward Anything, uh, uh, Frank, Nog, Heidi, either you guys, uh, strategies you use to keep children focused and entertained throughout the session, or are we good to go? I think we're good to go. The only thing I was going to add was uh, I'll do kind of that critical role thing where I will start to add accents to characters, you know, and, you know, that way it makes them feel more comfortable in a way. Uh, it's weird. I've seen it like even with my own kids when I start playing a character in character they just like their eyes light up like they're suddenly in the world they're not just sitting at a table so that's you know, one a lot strategy of people I use. A lot of people poo-poo the idea of using accents and so forth. I think they can be distracting at a table, uh, at least a table of adults, because usually we do the accents so poorly that there's just more distraction than they are helpful. But when it comes to kids, engage all five senses. And don't be pedantic on me and tell me that there are 14 senses, like the sense of balance. You know what I'm talking about. Somebody always does that in the comments. Uh, engage the five sentences as much as you can, and it, you'll, you'll immerse them into the world and into their characters. And I think you've got victory. No matter what the outcome is, you've won because the table's going to have fun. All right. We got to move on to segment two. Uh, they shouldn't be this long, but uh, this one was really setting the groundwork for what's to come. So I felt that it was uh, highly necessary to get out those uh, last couple of follow up questions there. Uh, so the next segment is going to be on creating a child friendly environment. Now, how do you do that? Let's check out our super chats first. What do we have here? Already read that one. 
earlier, Nutty Squirrel said, I ran an amazing Tales campaign for my son for almost five years before he graduated to Palladium recently. Well, first of all, I don't know about Amazing Tales, but if it causes you to graduate to Palladium, <laughs> get a thumbs up from here. And so uh, that, that's awesome. So that's another shout out for Amazing Tales. Maybe that's a game we'll have to cover at some point. Uh, like I said, our only child game that we've covered is uh, Hero Kids. I know there's another one like Look Away Evil or Stop Evil or something like that. I forget the name of it that we could have looked at, but we only looked at the one. Maybe maybe we'll have to look at more. Now, these aren't super chats, but I thought they were worth putting up. Uh, my son loves robots, so he's a gnome. Short because he's shorter than everyone else, so he picked gnome. That's interesting. Uh, with a robot. He loves playing his robo-engineer. There you go. Let's get that kid. That's uh, well, There is an anime that's like that. Um, I can't think of it. There's probably a million of them. My wife being Japanese and all, uh, but uh, that that uh, goes somewhere down that path. So if you can engage that uh, imagination, awesome. Indeed, ab about no LCD screens. Yeah, I, I don't allow de adults to have phones at the table. I'm an adult. I don't care. Uh, uh, but also selling it as a story, a book, an adventure that kids are participating versus just along for the ride. You know, again, a lot of people especially in my circles and myself included to some degree, really poo poo that word story. But for kids, that's just, that's hundred percent how it's got to be done. Okay. Not got to be, but that's the easiest way to engage them. Put them as the characters in the movie, the book, the story, wh whatever you want to call it. And, and let them know that that's where they are. They're, they're in this world and they are, you wouldn't use the word protagonist probably, but they are the protagonists of the story that's happening. And then uh, uh, Francois hit it. Uh, hit. I cannot read for some reason. Hit on the exact thing. I run paint and takes at conventions. You would not believe how many teachers and parents are incredibly grateful for showing kids something that isn't on a screen. Learn a skill, young kid. <laughs> and by the way, you guys are allowed to, when I'm doing these, after I read them, you're allowed to chime in as well if, if there's something you want to say about any of these comments too. So, And then... There's a like back and forth going on, but I like this one in particular where he said, uh, yeah, kids are horrified by being eaten, but they absolutely love the idea of fighting against creatures that want to eat them or cook them up in the oven or barbecue. <laughs> I, you know, that that's the weird thing about uh, about uh, kids as a whole. It's like you don't want to be too graphic with them, but at the same time, if you can make it in a fun way, something wants to eat me. Oh, no. <laughs> If that's oh, the way you get the immersion out of the kids, why not? Mm -hmm. um, and and it, like, as as was uh, one of the comments mentioned, it, it's about a story. And and immersion is not a a kid only thing. You, you're trying to draw in the adult audiences as well. The adult, the, the more adult players want that immersion as well. That just increases the level of enjoyment. I, I just found uh, adults are a slightly harder audience to get into the immersion space whereas kids almost fall over themselves to get immersed into the game uh it's just their attention span also allows them to fall back out of it a lot quicker than the adults who could sit there for eight ten hours and do mm -hmm. what they do uh, kids not so much uh, a couple things uh first there uh, i'm gonna put this up because uh there. Hey, I started. Oh, I didn't click on it. There we go. I said click. Click. <laughs> there we go. Jeepers. Uh, th there's an entire trope of manga that go into this concept of like uh, going into a dungeon and eating the monsters that uh, <laughs> that you find down there. And if that's something that'd be an interest to a kid, eating a gelatinous cube. Hey, who cares that it's supposed to uh, paralyze you and so forth? You know what? You're eating a gelatinous cube have at it <laughs> if you want to do that and the clarification crafty is the is for the kids is in terms of we're talking mostly kids i'd say between like 10 and 14 i mean there's no real age limit here we're not talking 17 year olds necessarily but we're, we're talking more kids that'd be around with their parents i think kind of the age that we've been talking about the most like 10 to 12 yes 10, 10 to 14 i think is probably okay, okay. Kind, of, kind of what we're we're aiming at I think once you hit the 15 to 18 year age, you're dealing with a level of maturity and probably a level of interest in 
in more adult themes and uh, y you're able to sharpen the edges a little bit, kind of like what, what Naga Hyde mentioned earlier, um, you know, 10 to 14, you want to go with the Star Trek, Star Wars level of violence. Uh, whereas the older kids, they, they want the full on, uh, you know, berserker rage and, and uh, gore and violence. And, and that's a dependent on obviously what your audience is. Mm -hmm. All right, Crafty, I've got that question start. I can't guarantee I'll ask it because I do have to move on. We've been on this one for an hour. We're not supposed to be on any segment for an hour, but uh, I think it really sets the, the groundwork here. So put up my little banner here. All right. Uh, do you want to join the show? If you think you have some presence and some charisma, the ability to entertain and educate, a good AV setup free from noise pollution, and an interest in discussing tabletop RPGs in this format, join the Some Rando RPG Livestream Discord. The link is in the description to stay tuned for future topics. I have all the topics that we're going to be discussing for the rest of the year on that Discord right now. And help us get to know you. Maybe we'll get you on the show and talk about your experiences as well. If you enjoyed this discussion, please like this video. Subscribe to all of the panelists' channel. I have everything that they've given me in the description now, which, yeah, you can find in the description that I just said because I don't know how to read a script. <laughs> all right, so, so with that, we are going to move on to our next topic.